hey, not everybody can be right all the time. In fact, everybody's got to be wrong some of the time. But I just saw a quick video from a natural vegan, and it's so true, and what she has to say is so right. So I wanted to put up a couple of words in agreement with her. The basic point she makes is that um, there is no logical reason, there is no scientific reason for a whole foods, plant-based diet to be nutritionally complete. There is no reason for a vegan diet, in principle, to be nutritionally complete. So the point is, yes, on almost any diet, conceivably, you can have nutritional deficiencies. And there are a lot of excuses being made, a lot of glorifications being offered for the vegan diet. As long as you eat enough calories, as long as you're eating fruit and vegetables all the time, you'll never get a deficiency. And the further point that a natural vegan makes, although very briefly to back this up, is that if people continue to believe in this or promote this misconception, it will result in ex-vegans. So I want to say up front, my shallow point, I have a shallow point and I have a deeper point. The shallow point is I actually knew one example of this. I'm not going to say like there are thousands and thousands of ex-vegans around the world who had this experience. The total number of people we're talking about in 2015 is small, but I knew someone on the internet. Uh, I think she never told me her age. She was maximum age 20. She might have been 18. Um, I only knew her on the internet because she was a vegan activist. So she wasn't just someone who was like passively vegan or vegan because her parents forced her to be. She was interested in veganism and advocated veganism and she was vegan herself. She had a shock when she went to the doctor's office and the doctor came back to her with blood test results and said, you have serious health problems due to deficiencies in your diet. And I really tried to talk to her after that because she, she flipped. I mean, she got spooked. We would say um, she got scared straight in um, par common parlance, in slang. For whatever reason, that experience for her of talking to the doctor and being told basically your vegan diet is killing you, she flipped 180 degrees. And I remember, like, she, she had the word vegan, like, in her username. She was really into veganism. And she went back to eating, like, pork sausages. Like, I couldn't believe the change. And now I wrote to her. I didn't write to her with hate mail. I didn't write to her with anger. I was writing to her reasoning with her because I thought I could talk her through this and be like, look, um, from my perspective, even if you had a short-term reason, even if you were on doctor's orders to consume animal products for like two weeks or something, to me that would never be a justification for in the long term resigning yourself to eating animal products on a daily basis. That makes no sense to me. Now, you know, people can fill in the blanks here. It is only under some really bizarre circumstances that you would be under legitimate doctor's orders to eat meat. Although the reality is doctors are human beings too. I've heard lots of stories about doctors giving bad advice of telling vegans and vegetarians that they have to eat meat for the sake of their health, even if it's not true. So although the legitimate scientific reasons for that, incredibly rare and narrow, the social, the socially real reasons given are probably all over the place. Um, to digress briefly, I myself had the experience of being treated like garbage by doctors in a hospital in France because their perception of me was that because I was vegan, I must be a member of some strange cult and the doctors treated me like crap and the nurses treated me like crap and it was, uh, it was such a struggle to get food in the hospital and just even though what I was actually saying in conversations with the doctors showed that I really did have very shrewd scientific attitudes, the questions I was asking everything else, they disregarded that and had this prejudicial attitude towards me because I was vegan. Um, so for a lot of people, that shock of having an authority figure treat you like crap, it can change your life. You can become an ex-vegan, as in the case of this girl with her blood tests. Um, on the other hand, if you're really accustomed to authority figures treating you like crap, it might not be that shocking. It's <laughs> probably what it is, man. Look, those doctors treat me like crap, but hey, you know, <laughs> if you've been through it before, you sure you're going to go through it again, might not impact you all that deeply. <laughs> so, you know, you, university professors treat you like crap, that would have a big impact if it's the first time. Tenth time, twentieth time, uh, you got a thick skin, you can deal with it. Uh, all right, so my shallow point here was, yes, a natural vegan is right. You can get 
dietary deficiencies on a vegan diet and a whole foods plant-based vegan diet even if you're eating enough calories even if you're eating fruits and vegetables and it can result in vegans becoming ex-vegan um the deeper point i want to raise here is that this type of delusion has been a big part of western culture and western civilization especially during the 19th century the original meaning of whole foods today we use whole foods in a, in a different sense to mean foods that aren't processed and so on but through the whole 19th century there was this big fad this pseudoscientific fashion of people believing that foods were nutritionally complete as long as you ate the whole food the entire food uh, so you see this in literature and also in nonfiction from the 19th century. I can remember it coming up repeatedly in 19th century Russian literature. So, you know, Tolstoy, Turgenev, that kind of thing. You remember in Turgenev, one of the characters, he's a, a devotee of this school of thought where he thinks as long as you eat like an entire fish, that that fish is going to be nutritionally complete and provide you with everything you need. In nonfiction, um, Henry David Thoreau um, the historically correct pronunciation of his name is Henry David Thoreau, but everyone says Henry, Henri David Thoreau. Um, very famous author, very influential, including influential for people who are interested in ecology and veganism. Uh, he participated in this popular delusion, and he believed that as long as you ate a whole cob of corn and this kind of thing, the entire plant with different types of plants eating the whole stock, that this would be nutritionally complete. Ultimately, um, this pseudoscientific idea is religious in its genesis. It ultimately relies on the idea that we live in a universe created by a benevolent uh, deity who ensures that things are nutritionally complete for human beings. And that is not true. Now today, even people who do not believe in any religion have a belief of this kind because they think that the relationship between nature and human nature is logical, diagrammatic, perfectly designed, perfectly intended to make your life easier and wonderful, and it isn't. We don't live in a human-centric universe. The stars in the sky are not aligned in a logical pattern to help you navigate on a ship. It's amazing that human beings had the ingenuity to figure out how to look at the stars in the sky and navigate a ship and figure out where they are on a map sit down and try it sometime. I had to do some studying of star charts because I was doing historical research in Southeast Asia. It's hard as hell. And I met one guy, um, one guy with a PhD, who really figured out how to use star positions. But a couple centuries ago, that was a major practical science human beings relied upon. Being able to get on a boat and figure out how far you'd gone by charting the distances of the stars in the sky. Okay? But it wasn't created for us. The logic and the system of relating the positions of the stars of the sky to our position on the planet is something we create with our minds, with our reasoning. We're imposing our logic on nature. There is absolutely... The relationship between nutrition and nature is arbitrary at best. Some plants are poisonous. Some plants are nutritious. With the passage of centuries of painstaking hard work and trial and error above all else, people have figured out what's going to poison them, what's going to feed them, what combinations of foods they can survive on. And man, this comes up in the social sciences also. There are many, many anthropological works that assume falsely that indigenous people who've been living in one climate, in one area, who've been indigenous to one area for thousands of years, that they will have a perfect understanding of how to get a nutritionally complete diet out of that environment, out of the plants that are available in the forest or uh, in the desert, whatever, whatever ecological niche they've been living in. And that is not true, and that is never true. I've seen studies of the Cree, our indigenous people here in Canada, that point out, look, there were some really nutritious plants available to them that they did not eat. They did not farm, and they did not collect from the forest. They did not exploit. And one of the reasons for that was that Cree culture, right up to the modern period, right up to their getting involved with Europeans, was tremendously focused on consuming meat. So naturally, also within plants, they just culturally ascribed values to some plants and ignored others. But above all else, that was a culture massively focused on hunting meat, on eating meat like beaver and moose. That was what was valued. 
Um, and interestingly, they put a very low value on eating um, rabbit. They considered eating rabbit rather a bad thing. There are old uh, Cree sayings, you can starve to death eating rabbit and stuff like that. But look, my point is, look, the Cree are one example. I've also looked at um, native people in Southeast Asia, in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, etc. Just like modern Western scientific people, they were all struggling with imperfect knowledge to figure out how to survive given the arbitrary raw materials that emerged from the environment around them and a long painstaking process of trial and error and observation. And finally, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, I mean, look at how recently the word protein entered the English language. The discovery of protein. The discovery of the, the lettered vitamins. Vitamins A, B, C, D. It's recent science. It's all of this is really fairly new knowledge. When my father and grandfather grew up, these misconceptions were legitimately rooted in ignorance. It's only in the last few years that the type of information you get by putting food into a mass spectrometer and analyzing what nutrients are there in what proportions and doing the incredibly difficult work of figuring out the impacts of chemicals within the human body nutrients and otherwise, that that stuff is starting to come together and we're getting a complete picture of what you need to survive. And look, I'm vegan. I'm encouraging you to go vegan. But I've got to tell you, um, when I became vegan, I had no idea that being vegan was better for your health. My attitude was, this is the right thing to do morally and ethically. And if it's bad for my health, so what? Because I'm not trying to win at the Olympics. I'm not going to do something immoral and unethical because it might help me run in a race a few seconds faster. I understand that some people are, but for me, that's not what matters. My concerns are ethical, environmental, ecological, whatever word you want to use. My concerns are about living a meaningful life and doing the best I can with the knowledge I've got, in the ecology I've got, in the context I've got, and including in the cultural context I've got. And for me, when I was younger, the answer to that was to become strictly vegetarian. As I got older, it became obvious to me the answer was to be strictly vegan. That's all I got to say. A natural vegan, thanks for making a great video and inspiring this rant. What up?